Hello, and welcome to the Calendar Public Library's regular Friday program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and once again, I have a story to tell. Allow me to connect two tales from 200 years apart by way of introducing today's book and author in the spotlight. First, we go to 1976, New York City, Manhattan. Before the foodie revolution afflicted New York's dining scene, you could judge a restaurant by the caliber of its patrons, not necessarily its chef. One of New York's best remembered bygone Watts, Cafe Mortimer, or simply Mortimer's to the cognoscenti, opened in March of 1976 at 75th Street and Lexington Avenue on the forever high profile and ritzy Upper East Side with only 19 tables in a utilitarian space that fast became the de rigueur dining dive of the National Studio 54 set. Quoting, it was a saloon where everybody was dressed up. <laughs> Caravaggi, the restaurant's longtime maitre d', told the New York Post. Fashion icons such as Paloma Picasso, Bill Blass, for whom the restaurant's meatloaf was named, and Calvin Klein fought and flaunted at Mortimer's. Joan Collins attended Hollywood dealmaker Irving Lazar's star-studded 1988 party, and she later threw her own party at Mortimer's the same year for the release of her book, Prime Time, in which she was feted by media titans, including Walter Cronkite, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., and Carl Bernstein, under hundreds of pink balloons. Its social prominence caught on quickly as a luncheon spot for the ladies of the neighborhood, the ladies who died that being Park and Fifth Avenues. Quote, I remember going there for lunches and seeing Diana Vreeland at the table in the corner and Anthony Quinn at another, said documentary filmmaker Baker Leacock, who frequented the restaurant in its early days, quoting, oh, and Elizabeth Taylor in line at the ladies' room. <laughs> he continues to say, it was a very high energy place. It was like a constant celebration. There was a feeling of joy and being carefree that doesn't exist now in social life. But for unbolded names on the list, it could be a tough table to get. The restaurant never took reservations officially. After the days of disco, its notoriously censorious and door-conscious owner, Glenn Baerbaum, continued to run the restaurant like a social club for gossip columnists and their prey. By the 1990s, Mortimer's was synonymous with the lifestyle of the rich and rapacious until Beerbaum's death in 1998 ended the party. Among the first lines written by the author in the introduction to today's book in the limelight are these, quote, my first thought when I met her was, who is this very small lady in a very big fur coat. I was 13. It was 1981, and I was eating lunch at Mortimer's with my mom. 
Now, hold that image in your mind's eye while I back up time to three years shy of two centuries. The year is 1784. A slightly older young man of 21 years followed his two brothers who had earlier left their small village in Germany to become immigrants to America. Like so many other European immigrants, New York City was in his fortune-making sights. In March of that year, 1784, he stepped off a sailing ship after a tumultuous four-month winter journey, carrying a small valise and a sack full of wooden flutes to begin what he hoped would launch his dream. As one of his later biographers put it, at that moment, quote, America as a land of opportunity had not yet become a cliché. The young man's schooling had stopped at age 14 when he joined his father as an apprentice butcher. He surely knew nothing about big fur coats. As a matter of fact, he knew nothing about fur at all. Were it not for a happenstance meeting between this young fortune hunter and a fellow German immigrant on board ship who worked trading furs in the American frontier. In 1784, Eva felt pelt was the common currency of the burgeoning frontier. One gun cost about 10 beaver skins, eight skins for a thick blanket, three for an ax, two skins for a half pint of Caribbean rum, or a pound of glass beads, which were easier to use for clothing decoration by the trading accustomed Native Americans than the traditional hammered and dyed porcupine quills. A fine petticoat cost five beaver pelts. He learned that there was serious money to be made in the buying and selling of pelts, and that it didn't require much capital up front. What it did require, though, was the gumption to voyage west into the American wilderness. Two years later, by the age of 23, the young man of five feet, five inches tall, but sturdy and hardy, set forth for the wilderness on a grueling, muddy, cold, and often uncharted 155 mile walk from New York City directly north to Albany. In time, the young man made his fortune, the greatest fortune in American history over 200 years of the 19th and 20th centuries. The young fur trader's name was Johann Jacob, John Jacob Astor. The very small lady in the very big fur coat was Mrs. Brooke Russell Astor, the last real Mrs. Astor and final figurehead of an American family that lived the rise and the fall of an American fortune. Mrs. Brooke Astor, originally of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and a family estate in Bar Harbor, Maine, passed away at age 105 in 2007. Today's 1923 book 
in the spotlight, 2023 book in the spotlight, is indeed titled Aster, the Rise and Fall of an American Fortune. And the author is American broadcast journalist and political commentator currently anchoring a very popular CNN news broadcast show. Yes, Mr. Anderson Cooper. Mr. Cooper was indeed the 13-year-old boy having lunch at Mortimer's in 1981 when he first met Mrs. Astor. His mother was another great socialite of the 20th and early 21st century, artist, author, actress, fashion designer, and heiress, Gloria Vanderbilt, who sadly passed away at age 95 in 2019. The book is co-authored by Catherine Howe, the book was recommended for our program by regular Friday Explorations viewer and writer, Mr. Michael Ledoux of Cambridge, Massachusetts. But before exploring the story too, let us consider some facts about the author, Mr. Anderson Cooper. Anderson Hayes Cooper was born in Manhattan a native New Yorker, and a man who has lived much of his life in the midst of Mortimer's, said with all admiration and due respect, Anderson. Cooper is the younger son of writer Wyatt Emery Cooper and artist Gloria Vanderbilt. His maternal grandparents were millionaire equestrian Reginald Claypool Vanderbilt of the Vanderbilt family and socialite Gloria Morgan Vanderbilt. Reginald's patrilineal great-grandfather was business magnate Cornelius Vanderbilt, who founded the prominent Vanderbilt shipping and railroad fortune. Cooper's media experience began early. As a baby, he was photographed by Diane Arbus for Harper's Bazaar. At the age of three, he was a guest on The Tonight Show on September 17, 1970, appearing with his mother again. At the age of nine, he appeared on To Tell the Truth as an imposter. From age 10 to 13, Cooper modeled with Ford models for Ralph Lauren, Calvin Klein, and Macy's. During his college years at Yale University, Cooper spent two summers as an intern at the Central Intelligence Agency while studying political science. He later pursued a career in journalism with no formal journalistic education. He does, however, claimed to have been a news junkie since he was in utero, quote unquote. After his first correspondence work in the early 1990s, he took a break from reporting and lived in Vietnam for a year, during which time he studied the Vietnamese language at Vietnam National University in Hanoi. And then, and then, his so successful career. Cooper was hired by ABC News as a correspondent in 1995, but he soon took more jobs throughout the network, working for a short time as a co-anchor, a reality game show host, and fill-in morning talk show host. In 2001, Anderson Cooper joined CNN where he was given his own show, Anderson Cooper 360 Degrees in 2003. He has remained the show's host since that time. He developed a reputation in his on the ground reporting of breaking news events with his coverage of Hurricane Katrina 
causing his popularity to sharply increase. For his coverage of the 2010 Haiti earthquake, Cooper received a National Order of Honor and Merit, the largest honor granted by the Haitian government. From September 2011 to May 2013, he also served as the host of his own syndicated daytime talk show, Anderson Live. Cooper has won 18 Emmy Awards and two Peabody Awards, as well as an Edward Murrow Award and the Overseas Press Club Award in 2011. Anderson Cooper courageously and honestly shared his gay sexual orientation in 2012, becoming the most prominent openly gay journalist on American television. In 2016, Cooper became the first openly LGBT person to moderate a presidential debate, and he has received several GLAAD media awards. Anderson Cooper is also the author of three number one New York Times bestsellers, The Rainbow Comes and Goes, Dispatches from the Edge, and Vanderbilt, co-authored by Catherine Howe as well, about his very family. Still a native New Yorker, Cooper lives with his two young sons in Manhattan, not far from Mortimer's. Catherine Howe, his co-author on this book, the American no novelist Catherine Howe was born and raised in Houston, Texas, but now splits her time between New England and New York City. She earned her undergraduate degree in art history and philosophy at Columbia University. She began writing fiction while completing her graduate work in American and New England studies at Boston University. How currently teaches at Cornell University. Catherine Howe specializes in historical novels in which she explores, quote, the contingent nature of reality and belief. Her debut novel was the New York Times bestseller, The Physic Book of Deliverance Dane, in 2009 related to the Salem witch trials. Its success led her to being a guest on several TV news shows, as well as Salem Unmasking the Devil on the National Geographic Channel. She's also written The House of Velvet and Glass, Conversion, The Appearance of Annie Van Sinderen in 2015, that was all one title, and A True Account, in 2023. Her fiction has been translated into more than 20 languages. Now to the book, Aster, The Rise and Fall of an American Fortune, the story of the Aster family over four generations is a quintessentially American story of ambition, invention, destruction, and reinvention. The family fortune, first made by a beaver trapping business in the West that grew into an empire, was then amplified by holdings in America in Manhattan real estate. Over the ensuing years, Astor's ruled the gilded age of New York society and inserted themselves into the high-profile political and cultural life of the city. There was also loss and suffering, perhaps the most famous being the loss of John Jacob Astor IV with the sinking of the Titanic on April 15, 1912, one of the many shocking and unexpected twists in the family's story. His wife, Madeline, survived in lifeboat number four and gave birth four months later to their second son, John Jacob Jakey 
Astor the Sixth. At the time of his death, he was a business magnate, a real estate developer, investor, writer, and had served as a lieutenant colonel in the Spanish-American War. He was not only the richest passenger aboard the RMS Titanic, but was thought to be among the richest people in the world at that time, with a net worth of roughly $87 million, equivalent to $2.75 billion in 2023 currency. This unconventional page-turning historical biography also features black and white and color photographs of paintings of Astor family members over the years, Grand Fifth Avenue homes, the iconic Waldorf Astoria Hotel, as well as palatial castles and stately homes in England. Anderson Cooper and Catherine Howe brilliantly chronicle the Astor name and how it has come to mean what in America, offering a window into the making of America and especially the making of New York City. In my humble opinion, following the journey of John Jacob Astor, from his very, very modest roots in Astoria, Germany, through the many stages of his unlikely success in his lifetime, and continuing on through three more competing two son generations, was for me a rare opportunity to finally know all sides of the Astor mystique in American history. As glorious as their Gilded Age sounds, not all aspects of it were good nor exemplary. In addition to the tales of rapidly growing wealth from the West to the Manhattan landmarks of Astor Place, the Astor Opera House, the Astor Hotel, the Waldorf Hotel, then called then the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, and of course, the recently so grand residence of the Astors at 840 Fifth Avenue. There were dark clouds, always. Ambition and invention were clouded by cunning, selfish determination, hubris, infighting, and greed. Neither the Native Americans in the fur trapping of the West, nor the destitute immigrants in the family-owned tenements of East, were treated with care or respect. The book offers a focused and honest and concise reading experience in black and white, but more so in a wide spectrum of gray dark gray clouds. I enjoyed the book immensely. I think it's absolutely brilliantly written. The book is divided, as what you would expect, into several chapters. It's almost so tempting to begin at the beginning, but I think I've told you enough about that arrival uh, of the young man from Germany in uh, 1781 and the short time going west, before going west, and beginning to establish um, America's greatest fortune over years. Um, it's very tempting to do that, uh, but I'm not going to. I'm going to skip that. And I'm going to try to give you a sense of um, where the wealth of the West came into play in the wealth of the East, uh, when, after the fortune was built and everything was uh, running smoothly in the West, uh, the Astors, of course, uh, set up home uh, forevermore in New York City. So I'm going to read from chapter four of the book. Uh, it is called 840 Fifth Avenue, and that is the spectacular residence um, of the Astor family 
uh, which came about actually when there were twin residents, residences uh, built also on Fifth Avenue uh, between two competing brothers. They were given that upon the death of their father. And one of them then tore it down and built the Waldorf Hotel, uh, leaving the other building for the other cousin, who eventually finally tore that down and built the Astoria part of the Waldorf Astoria. And they were connected. They were managed by the same manager, but they were distinctly themselves, let's say it that way. And the family then moved to 840 Fifth Avenue. And this uh, building is so spectacular. Uh, and upon the death, actually, of, of Brooke Astor and uh, her old son and several other complications there, uh, the building was sold. So I'm going to start reading there and give you a feel of uh, the period where at 1908, at this point in time, jumping from uh, 18, uh, as we did, jumping away from 17, actually, 1803, all the way to 1908, and begin the feel of the Astros in New York. Um, this starts with a quote, actually, from a gentleman named Ward McAllister. She was, in every sense, society's queen. Of course, speaking of Mrs. Astor, a hackney cab rattled up the brick cobbles of Fifth Avenue one morning in late summer 1908. Its still new green and red carriage body sporting lanterns on either side. Its driver dressed in a rented uniform designed to make him look as trustworthy and honorable as a West Point cadet. The 50 cent per mile rate was exorbitant especially given what she was being paid, but it was worth it. Rebecca Inslee couldn't afford to arrive at her destination rumpled. She peered out the window at the passing marble facades of the houses lining the avenue, their windows blank with silks, their doors closed to all but the most exclusive company. Today, she was finally being invited inside. The cab threaded its way through deepening traffic, dappled with leafy green shade cast by the trees in Central Park, past the palaces of New York City's moneyed aristocracy. Every year, fashionable New York moved farther north. Rebecca could admit, if pressed, that she had mixed feelings about society, Something in her stolid Midwestern nature rebelled against such extravagance at the same time that she appreciated the fineness of its taste and the strange mystery of its power. But despite her misgivings, she had always admired the woman she was scheduled to meet. And the more she learned about her, her shrewdness, her interest in art, and ideas and current affairs, her towering reputation, the more appreciative she became. For that reason, Rebecca was the perfect writer for this assignment. The daughter of a notable Indianapolis doctor and sister of a successful businessman, she had spent some years living in Europe and acquiring continental polish before alighting in New York City, five years earlier, determined to make her mark as a writer. She was in her mid-thirties, but passed for younger. Her manners were impeccable, and The Delineator was a thoroughly respectable publication for which she worked, with none of the sordid gossip of town topics and not as middle-brow as Harper's Weekly. The Delineator was a trusted news source for women interested in keeping up appearances with current fiction of the moment, butteric patterns, and articles of interest on politics and home economics. Rebecca's elusive interview subject, 
who hadn't deigned to speak to the press in more than two decades, wouldn't have considered anything less. The cab pulled up to the corner of 65th Street and rolled to a stop. Rebecca climbed out, careful to keep her skirts clear of the gutter, and looked up at the imposing wedding cake that was 840 Fifth Avenue. Like most of the ancestral homes of old New York, the building was almost brand new. Its smooth marble, grand mansarded roofs, elegantly not quite gothic arched windows, and ornate twin balconies, the only real clue that this massive castle was actually two buildings in one, had been designed by Richard Morris Hunt, favorite architect of New York's richest families. It had taken two long years to complete, finally opening its exclusive doors in 1896, when the woman Rebecca had come to interview was already a widow and in her mid-sixties. Before that, the home's occupant had reigned over New York society from an elegant brownstone on East 34th Street and had spent a charmed girlhood in the then Tony enclave of Bond Street, just off Lafayette Place. But Rebecca's subject's infancy had been passed in a proper home near Bowling Green, all the way at the southernmost tip of Manhattan. Fashion in New York City had been fall had followed her northward over the long years of her life until she finally settled here on Fifth Avenue in a would-be ancient French chateau that was all of 12 years old. Rebecca appreciated the imposing front door, shaded under an awning thoughtfully designed to keep the rain off guests in the heated crush of entry for a ball and knock. No balls had taken place here for some time. Menus were still meticulously discussed, flowers decided upon, guest lists poured over and pruned and reshuffled and pruned again. But the orders for flowers were never delivered to Clunder, the preferred supplier of the city's most elegant hostesses. The extravagant entertainments that used to bring Rebecca's subject attention acclaim and power, now took place only in the halls of memory. The Chatelaine of this house had suffered a severe nervous breakdown in 1906. Society still feared her, but she was seen only on her afternoon carriage rides through Central Park, attended by medical assistants, where she greeted admirers who existed mostly in her own mind. The door was opened by a distinguished man in rich blue livery. This was probably Thomas Haig, who had run the eminent lady's household since the most glittering years of her reign in 1876, when Rebecca herself was just a baby back in Indiana. She was expected, having made her arrangements with Maria de Baudil, the Grand Dame's social secretary, known around New York and Newport as much for her taste in lush ostrich feather hats and smart dresses as for the elegant handwriting with which she used to address the coveted invitation to her employer's entertainments. Cade ushered Rebecca inside. The rest of the household staff was also outfitted in livery, green coats, white knee breeches, black stockings, shoes with gold buckles, and red whip whipcord vests studded with brass buttons stamped in an invented coat of arms. Years later, a social observer would note the following about this household, quote, the livery of their footman was a close copy of that familiar at Windsor Castle, and their linen was marked with emblems of royalty, at the opera, they wore tiaras, and when they dined, the plates were in keeping with imperial pretensions, at least so far as money could buy the outward signs of sovereignty. Indeed, 
The daughter of Queen Victoria in her Potsdam Palace could have made no such display of money. Even Rebecca's European finish would have left her unprepared for the world into which she was about to set foot. She passed through the domed entry vestibule and into a long, lavish hallway lined with dour busts of Stuyvesants and Livingstons and other ghosts of old New York. Then stepped into a great hall covered in marble, from the end of which soared a candlelevered staircase lit by a massive crystal chandelier and softly glowing gas lamps. There, making her way slowly down the steps, a wrinkled hand heavy with jewels, gripping the banister for support, came Rebecca's elusive subject, Mrs. Astor. There were several women in New York who could, theoretically, have gone by that name, but only one of them did. Caroline Webster Shermeron Astor was still, even in her relatively diminished state, the only Mrs. Astor who mattered. Mrs. Astor would not be rushed, though Rebecca thought that the grand lady seemed much sturdier than might be expected of a woman approaching 80. She was buttoned into a rather severe black day dress, and her smallish figure had gone somewhat stout, but Rebecca would never say so in print. Mrs. Astor held herself with the regality and self-assurance of her position, her soft waves of hair kept artfully black by a skilled hairdresser and topped with a capacious black hat, swathed in general and gentle folds of black veiling. These days, Mrs. Astor was never seen without a veil, which had an elegantly softening effect on the lines etched into her face by age. And, Rebecca knew, worry. But today, underneath the veil, Mrs. Astor was smiling. Rebecca knew she must tread carefully. Mrs. Astor's trust had not been easily won. The great lady seemed under the impression that there had been a turn toward decency and dignity in journalism and Rebecca had no wish to disabuse her of this impression. Mrs. Astor exercised complete control over how she was presented to the press, never allowing herself to be photographed unless she was in a studio, never granting interviews for any reason. If her rival, Alva Belmont, formerly Vanderbilt, had had a genius for courting and manipulating the press, Mrs. Astor had a talent for circumspection. The night the Metropolitan Opera opened in 1883, presenting an audacious challenge by new money to the iron exclusivity of the 18 hereditary patron boxes at the Old Gods Academy of Music, of which Mrs. Astor was the standard bearer, the lady herself had arranged to be out of town. As far as I was concerned, Mrs. Astor began as they settled next to each other in the elegantly appointed reception room. The press had never been unkind, but rather too kind. I would say good morning in the drawing room to some cultivated young woman or an immaculate young man and the next day's paper would have two or three columns of things I never even imagined. She wished that New York journalists would have the high sense of honor and personal responsibility that English journalists manifested. Rebecca hurried to agree with her. Mrs. Astor knew about Rebecca's years in Europe, and she mused over her own past travels abroad and over the shift in perspective she had always enjoyed upon her return home. Quote, I believe in a republic, Mrs. Astor continued, and I believe in a republic in which money has a great deal to say. 
as in ours. Money represents with its energy and character. It is acquired by brains and untiring effort. It is kept intact only by the same means. Best of all, there is the American idea demonstrated about us every day that each man can bring happiness and comfort to himself and to those he loves. He will only set about it and that education, books, pictures, travel are all within his reach. <laughs> Caroline Astor, called Lena by her friends, had been born in 1830 into a family rich in shipping money and more important, prestige. Shermerhorns in America dated from the founding of New Amsterdam. And when Lena was an infant, her father's wealth was estimated to be around half a million dollars, today's equivalent of around 13 million. Her mother had been a Van Cortland. As a girl, Lena was tutored in French and other arts thought necessary for a young lady of worth and breeding. During her early years, Lower Manhattan had already begun to team with commerce, and the old Knickerbocker families had begun to hunt for more exclusive enclaves in which to establish themselves. The Shermer homes settled around the corner from Lafayette Place. When she was 23, Lena married William Backhouse Astor II, the second son of William Backhouse Astor Sr. William Sr. had divided the family fortune between two of his sons, though much of the control over the family business was given to William Jr.'s brother, John Jacob III, who had been named after their powerful grandfather. Lena's husband, William Backhouse Astor II, was a pleasure-loving and genial man, known as much for his racehorses and his yachtsmanship as for his wealth, but he never got along with his brother John, who was seven years older. William thought John had a snobbish and superior attitude toward him, which he did, and John thought William wasted his time on frivolities, which was also true. Not having much say over the family business made it especially easy for William to indulge his considerable appetite for fine and fast things. We don't know exactly what brought Lena and William together. A match by their mothers? Lena's plans for the Astor wealth? In any event, the union of Lena's pedigree and intelligence with William's fortune would forge nothing less than a social juggernaut in what became Gilded Age New York. Their private relationship, however, quickly deteriorated into an arrangement of convenience. By the 1870s, at the pinnacle of Lena's social power and influence, William's role in the life of his wife and five children was largely symbolic his extramarital affairs were common knowledge, and Mrs. Astor was more often seen with her favorite walker, a man, often gay, explicitly or implicitly, and therefore safe, who escorts married women to social events. Ward McAllister. Then she was with her husband. Mrs. Astor, Rebecca asked, treading with some care. In the Middle West, and even on the other side of the water, we hear charges of special viciousness, even degeneracy in New York society, not among the old guard, of course, but among the younger set. Can you comment? I can speak with authority about our young people, Mrs. Astor said, with the sort of assurance common to older people speaking about youth. I have always kept in close touch with them. They are of a new age and often have ideas different from my own, conservative ones, and they are full of health and abundant spirits, 
embodiments of the new age of athletic development and out of door sport. It is perhaps true, she allowed, that they frequently go into excess in amusement, but they are not degenerate and they are not vicious. Young men work hard to manage their fortunes, Mrs. Astor suggested. Didn't they deserve some healthy sports as a well-earned diversion? Mrs. Astor knew something about young men and their diversions. Her husband, William, had been devoted to racehorses, even fielding a thoroughbred named Vagrant, who triumphed in the 1876 Kentucky Derby. When William's first yacht, at the time the largest privately owned one in existence, uh, was no longer equal to his needs, he had it replaced with an even larger, more sumptuous one, Christian the Normahal, which could be translated as Light of the Harem. Caroline Astor had seemingly invented the art of refusing to know things that she did not wish to know. This steadfast refusal had insulated her from pity or public embarrassment. Once, upon being asked about one of William's long absences on his yacht, known by everyone in New York to be stocked with prostitutes, Mrs. Astor had said, Oh, he is having a delightful cruise. The sea air is so good for him. It is a great pity I am such a bad sailor, for I should so much enjoy accompanying him. <laughs> As it is, I have never even set foot on the yacht. Dreadful confession for a wife, is it not? <laughs> she was, of course, lying. Years later, a granddaughter wrote that Mrs. Astor was not a bad sailor at all. In fact, she would willingly chaperone young relatives on windy sailing dates in Newport, Rhode Island. And grandmother was the only chaperone intrepid enough to go. She was never seasick. But Mrs. Astor's refusal to acknowledge behavior she found unsettling extended beyond her management of her wayward husband. Our young women, she continued to Rebecca, warming to her topic, are easily trained in domestic matters and taught to appreciate their responsibility toward the poor. There are no such barriers between the very rich and the very poor, as some newspapers would have the world believe. All of my friends do a great deal for the poor. Their daughters are brought up from infancy to look upon their charity work as an important part of their lives. Yes, she allowed when Rebecca gently pressed her on this idealized picture of society's rising young women. I have heard that young women smoke and drink and do other terrible things. I, I know a great many of them and know them very well. I have known them since they were born. And I am quite sure there is not one in my circle who is a cigarette fiend or who drinks to excess. Thirteen years after this interview, in 1921, the chief literary chronicler of Mrs. Astor's Gilded Age world, Edith Wharton, would capture this kind of deliberate unawareness in her Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Age of Innocence. Quote, the world of her youth had fallen into pieces and rebuilt itself without her even being conscious of the change. Wharton writes, describing her character Mae Welland, and it's hard not to imagine she had Caroline Astor in mind. Quote, this hard, bright blindness that kept her immediate horizon apparently unaltered. Her incapacity to recognize changes made her children conceal their views from her as Archer, her husband, concealed his. There had been from the first a joint pretense of sameness, a kind of innocent family hypocrisy, a joint uh, in which father and children had unconsciously collaborated. And she had died thinking the world a good place full of loving and harmonious households like her own. 
that Mrs. Astor's household had not been particularly loving or even harmonious was another inconvenient fact she would never admit, certainly not to a reporter and possibly not even to herself. But perhaps this hard, bright unawareness was born not out of mere denial. Mrs. Astor was businesslike, even unsentimental about what she saw as her responsibility to the dignity of the family name. Quote, one must have high ideals and do the best one can to realize them, she told Rebecca, a shade of steel in her gray eyes behind the veil. My ideals in society have always been very definite. I have not realized them, but who does realize his ideals in this world? Mrs. Astor had been Rebecca's age when the Civil War ripped the United States apart, and when the South's defeat finally came, she had understood that in the uneasy years of reconstructing the Union, someone would have to decide what made American society American. Someone had to set the standard. Someone had to decide what constituted American taste. Someone had to stand ready to demonstrate that the United States need not be overshadowed by the old societies of Europe. New York, after all, was the city of the future, and the United States was the country that held New York. In this project, Mrs. Astor had had an ally the transplanted Southerner Samuel Ward McAllister. They were about the same age, McAllister having been born in 1827 in Savannah, Georgia. He had married Sarah Gibbons, also from Georgia, and then spent several years in Europe polishing himself. He was determined to know everything that a person of fashion needed to know. He studied court manners, architecture, clothes, food, drink, and resort spots. When he returned to New York with his newfound social expertise, Ward McAllister established a career as the most complete dandy in America. In this project, he attached himself to the woman he called his mystic rose, Lena Astor. Distantly related to Mrs. Astor by marriage, his cousin had married William Backhouse Astor Jr.'s sister, Emily. McAllister was easily able to enter her circle. Under his tutelage, Mrs. Astor began her swift transformation from old New York to new American elite. McAllister was the one to first to suggest she choose livery for her servants, and he steered her toward collecting French art, hiring a French chef, and serving her dining companions exclusively on French and German china. Ward McAllister also devised a system of gradation in society that split people into knobs and swells. The knobs had old money and fancy antecedents, like Mrs. Astor, and her Shearmerhorns, and her Van Cortlands, and Lorelards. The swells, for their part, were the nouveau riche, then rolling into New York City, their pockets bulging from industrialization and making a point of social climbing, like the Vanderbilts and the Fricks. Mrs. Astor and Ward McAllister's great insight lay in how to knit the two together, the old God and the new God. They decided that anyone wanting acceptance into society had to be three generations removed from whoever had gotten their hands dirty making the money. Conveniently, Mrs. Astor was the wife of a grandson of John Jacob Astor in addition to being one of the Schirmerhorns, a Dutch family that first settled in New Amsterdam in 1636. Also, 
To run in the fast crowd that Mrs. Astor and Ward McAllister were fashioning, one had to have at least a million dollars in cash, about $30 million today. As McAllister famously told the New York Tribune on March 25, 1888, quote, a fortune of a million is only respectable money. After the Civil War, a sense of American cultural inferiority persisted, even as the newly reunited states emerged as an international player in industry and economic power. The country's youth made it seem lacking in tradition, lacking in heritage. Mrs. Hastert viewed the enrichment of society as a nationalist enterprise. As one historian of the Gilded Age has noted, quote, elegant dinners and splendid balls provided one expression of the desire enacted for the elect, but often viewed as adornments for the masses who could share in their aesthetic triumph through accounts in the press and thus be themselves inspired to more cultivated heights. Together, Mrs. Astor and Ward McAllister decided to establish a social institution that would feel steeped in tradition despite being sparkling new. They called it the Patriarch Ball. And you can just imagine what that was all about. <laughs> well, I shall end there just to give you a taste of the world of the Astor family. Um, and uh, the aristocracy of New York City, not to be outdone by anything European, God knows. Um, and of course, uh, this was not the last generation of the Astors. Uh, there was one generation to follow when this Mrs. Astor died. Uh, and then we eventually come, of course, to Mrs. Brooke Astor. It's a very fascinating book, uh, not only about the New York City, have your fascination with the city and the development. Uh, it also talks a good deal about the island of Manhattan and how it had uh, hills and mountains and stone cliffs and ledges, which all had to be flattened. So there's a great history of New York in it. And then side by side, obviously, the history of, of the family. And the good, the bad, and the ugly, I suppose one could say. Uh, and uh, there were some pretty bad skirmishes. And when we get down, finally, to the last generation, most of the players were not Astors originally. We were married into the Astor family, as was Brooke Astor. But anyway, it's a, it's a very fascinating book about a, a part of American history that I knew little about, although I knew all the names, I just didn't know the journey. And I think um, the journey is quite fascinating. I highly recommend it, Mr. Anderson. I think you've done a great job, as you did with Vanderbilt, which I read when it came out. So thank you very much, Anderson Cooper. And let me take a few moments in what time is remaining to tell you about next week's book. As always, I try to make a bit of a 180 degree turn. And this is a book that I read I met several years ago. It was published in 1948 and loved it so much that I actually ended up moving to the location uh, for a few years. Um, and that location is Morocco. And by telling you that, telling you 1948, you probably put two and two quickly together that it is the book by Paul Bowles called Sheltering Sky. Sheltering Sky, published in 1948, uh, Time magazine at one point considered it 100 of the best English language novels between 1923 and 2005. That's a long, long time. <laughs> so uh, over those 82 years, they considered Sheltering Sky one of the top. And the Modern Library is still part of that 100 best books of the century. Um, so uh, it does have some great laurels behind it. It is a landmark of 20th century literature, really. Um, and it examines the ways in which Americans, the incomprehension of Americans, of alien cu cultures, 
It leads to the ultimate destruction of these cultures. So the storyline goes like this. Port and Kit Moresby, an American couple of independent means, have been traveling aimlessly for 12 years. By the time they reach Morocco, they have become disaffected and alienated. They take up with a series of unreliable, rootless wanderers. On a trip to the interior, Port contracts typhoid fever. Out of apathy, he has neglected to be vaccinated and dies. Kit has an affair with an Arab and joins his household, but their relationship soon falls apart. Kit is found and returned to Oran. She is teetering on the bridge of insanity and finds an opportunity to disappear into the crowded bazaar. The Sheltering Sky, which is the first novel by Paul Bowles, published in 1948, as I mentioned, it's considered a model of existential fiction, to be more specific about it. It sold well and was a critical success. It was actually described by the author as, quote, an adventure story in which the adventures take place on two planes simultaneously in the actual desert of Morocco and in the inner desert of the spirit. His cool, detached prose contrasts with the increasingly violent and irrational events of the novel. It's quite a fascinating book, and I've enjoyed rereading it um, and putting my own knowledge into the locations um, and the bazaars and all the parts of, of Marrakesh, particularly for me, not Casablanca, but Marrakesh. Um, so it's a very fascinating novel. If you've not read it before, I invite you to join me. You might find it a very interesting. Um, thank you so much for joining me today and for being with me in New York City in the Gilded Age with the Astor family. If you did enjoy the book, uh, please press the iconic little thumbs up that you see there in front of you. Feel free to also share it with a friend. The share icon is two to the right of that. There is also an opportunity to comment. Comment about the program or the book or the Astras, or to use that space to uh, tell us of your favorite book. As we put together May and June coming up very quickly here, um, we'd love to know if you have a favorite book, as this book today was one of the favorites of The Gentleman of Cambridge. Also, we ask you to subscribe. A subscription usually suggests money, magazines, book clubs, wine clubs, etc. Not so, obviously, with this. It is simply for us to have your email address. So we may update you on the vast number of programs at the Camden Public Library. It also gives us not only a vote of confidence, but it also gives us a vote in the annual competition. What is that competition? Yes, indeed. All of the public libraries in the state of Maine, small, medium, and large public libraries, vie every year to be the leader in the state for the highest number of subscribers to their YouTube programs channel. Everyone has them. Every library has programs. They're filmed and put on the channel. Well, we have been in that position for about 16 months now. <laughs> number one, our medium-sized library headed towards small. Um, and number one in the state of Maine for uh, over a year, 16 months. Um, so please, as we move up to about 2,000 subscribers, we're moving in that direction this year. Uh, we'd love to have you subscribe and just... Uh, receive information on our program so that you can stay tuned. Thank you again for being with me today. I record this on the day when a snowstorm is expected. And here we are on the 3rd of April. So we shall see what we shall see. Do be careful and the rest of winter come spring. Uh, may the daffodils survive. Do take care of yourself. And if the opportunity arises, I hope you'll breathe a little positive karma into the world we live in at the moment. 
is filled with a certain amount of negative karma, more than we need, thank God, or God forbid, I should say. Please, a little positive karma, a little smile, a comment, a little conversation in the produce department at Annaford's. Anything that you can give off some positivity would be great for the planet, I think. Once again, thank you very much. Take care of yourself. I hope I see you next week. Goodbye.